Today, Victor Salva is best known as the man behind the Jeepers Creepers franchise and still makes films in which semi-naked young people are terrorized. In his personal blog, Salva often muses about himself, his place in the world, and his art in general. Quote, I think my art is just a way for this lost boy to tell the world how he felt, how he feels, and what he hopes for. He's a man. He's a grown man, writing about how he's just a lost boy. The story continues, so I guess by this definition, Victor Salva is crossing his fingers and wishing really, really hard for an eternity spent terrorizing semi-naked youths. Once again, that story from Vice's Charlie Dixon. Charlie mentions in the story there, Victor Salva was convicted of molesting a child actor on the set of his first major film, Clown House. Joining us today is that former child actor, now adult male, by the name of Nathan Forrest Winters. Nathan, welcome to the Millennial Report. Thank you, Wade. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely great to have you along with us. I know that you've experienced a lot of things um, in your life, some things that you as a child should ever have had to experience, but let's not start there. Let's, let's take it all the way back. Take us to childhood uh, before this incident. Uh, how and when did you become an actor? What got you into the business? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I always wanted to be an actor or a performer, entertainer. Um, it was first it was music and then um, how we ca it actually it all happened when I met Victor um, <laughs> it wasn't something that I necessarily I don't think dreamt about too much as far as being like this famous actor but um, because I met Victor when I was six he was working at a daycare center um, where one of my mother's friend's daughters went uh, attended and um, he was talking to her one evening about a film he was making called Goblin's Gold, and now he's still, you know, producing films in his backyard at this point. Um, and he needed somebody to help him with the props. And so <clears throat> my mom's very, very artistic, and um, so her friend recommended my mom, and that's how my mom met Victor, and she ended up making the goblin's head for him. And uh, because of her involvement, I was introduced to him, and then from then on, it was kind of like this you know, wow, he makes movies, and so that's kind of where the, the, the idea of being an actor sparked, was from meeting Victor. And tell me, Nathan, who's Victor Salva at this point in your life to you, um, and, and who is he to Hollywood in this very moment that you're speaking of? Um, he was unknown in Hollywood at that point, um, and to me, he was just like one of my parents' friends, uh, more of an acquaintance, I guess, because, <clears throat> you know, he, he started the grooming process fairly, fairly early on, um, from, from what I remember. remember. And, then, and by, by grooming, grooming, I mean, I mean um, basically, basically developing, developing the, the trust, trust of, of, of my, my parents, parents and, and, and my trust and, and adoration. And, um, you know, they, they, they take, take their time. time. Someone, Someone like Victor, 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 like Victor they, they have no, they're very patient, very manipulative, and they take their time. So, um, it, was it was within, within the first year that the abuse, abuse started, but um, really he was, he was unknown in Hollywood, and um, he was just a friend of the family. And then Clown House happens. Take us through your experience working on the horror film Clown House and how your relationship grew with Victor Salva. Um, again, so the grooming process, within the first year, he had started abusing me. And uh, I think when I was about nine or ten, he had started production on another backyard movie called Something in the Basement. And he had maybe 19 or 20 boys my age audition for the lead role. And I begged him and begged him because I was at his house. I mean, by this time, you know, the abuse had been going on. If I was nine, it had been going on for probably two and a half years, maybe. Um, <laughs> so at, at that, that point, point, he had, had like, like the full trust, trust in my parents, parents where, you, you know, know, he, he would, would take me for full weekends, weekends and, and uh, taking the amusement parks and things, things like that, that. and, um, you, you know, know, always under the guise of, like, 
giving my parents a break because I had an older brother, uh, it's five years younger, and <clears throat> so their hands were pretty full. full. And uh, so, so something in the basement, basement again, you know, this, this is one of like nine or ten. I begged him to let me audition for it, and he kept telling me I don't want you to audition, I don't want to hurt your feelings in case you're not good, and da 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 And so uh, I ended up talking him into it, and when I auditioned, he was like, okay, you got the part, you know, like, you have the part. And um, so I was stoked, I was, you know, ecstatic, tell all the kids at school I was going to start on this movie. And, um, and then that, that went in one, that was entered into the Sony Film Festival, I believe it was, in uh, San Francisco. And a couple was on the panel of judges. And it won first place. And then afterwards, a couple approached the and said, you know, I, I like your style, whatever. And, you know, I'll give you some money if you want to make another film. Do you have another film, to, you know, another script to film? And he, so he went home and he wrote Clown House with me specifically in the starring role, as well as the middle brother, Brian McHugh. Because um, he co-starred in something in the basement with me, so that that film was written with me and Brian in the the two main roles, and uh, and that's where Clown House came to be. Was you know Coppola's production and or I guess Commercial Pictures, which is his production company. And Clown House really is to this day uh, quite a cult hit, um, and yeah. something that a lot of people uh, still reference as one of those you know gritty horrifying films that really knocks down um, you know sort of uh, I, I suppose at the time um, you know the the standards of horror films it, it allowed for a much more grittier feel because of maybe it's more low budget uh, approach but right. at, at what point did you realize that you were being victimized um, so you, you've been groomed and and for many children who have been through this um, you don't realize it right off the bat because you know you trust this adult in your life you right. believe this person has the best of intentions at what point did you realize you were being victimized by a child molester who just happened to also be uh, a Hollywood director um. I want to say it was fairly late. I mean, I'm, I was kind of naive in that sense. Very, I've always had a very trusting nature. So um, I guess it probably wasn't until right after Something in the Basement, because Clown House and Something in the Basement were probably a year apart, I want to say, um, maybe more, maybe a year and a half. And um, so sometime in between those two films that I like really started to figure out that, you know, and, and really it had a lot to do with, you know, it being the mid 80s and and just the current events at that time, you know, so much of the news was filled with with AIDS and homosexuals. And, and so it was like that was the that was always the the put down at school. That was the burn at school was to call somebody, you know, a fag or, you know, whatever. So is is that's really what kind of opened my eyes to it that. Not necessarily that it was wrong for an adult to be doing this with a child, because I, I, I don't think I really grasped that until he was arrested. And, and I mean, I still I did everything I could to protect him um, when I told my parents and, and I testified. And um, so it was really more just it was the, the homosexual aspect of it, it that I got from school that I felt like was, you know, something's not right here because I've, I've always I've always loved women and um you know, so it's, that's what really the first the red flags were all about was that. Um, but again, when you're a victim, you, you teach yourself, you train yourself to be conditioned to not listen to your gut instincts, to not listen to those, you know, sirens going off, the, you know, the, and to ignore the warning flags. So um, it really, yeah, it, it wasn't until after he was arrested, I really started to discover just how wrong it was. Now, take us up to, to that point specifically where he ended up getting arrested. How did your parents find out, first of all? What, um, what was that conversation like? What sort of, how did you tip them off to what was happening, um, that you were being groomed and molested by Victor Salva? Um, my mom had had her suspicions for a while. Hmm. Um, and I just, I kept, kept telling her, you know, nothing, nothing's wrong. No, nobody's hurt me. Nobody's touched me. Um, and again, it's all done through manipulating the love and the trust of a child. Right. And so it wasn't um, because he's threatening violence or anything like that. It was more like 
you told me that I wouldn't be able to see him anymore and that I wouldn't be able to act anymore. And um, so that's really, you know, was my motivation. Cause I, I've always been very pretty, try to be pretty honest, even as a kid, you know, and I have a very hard time lying to my mom. And so when she kept asking me, it was like almost a physical pain to lie to her. And Victor was very, very um, comfortable Hmm. I'll say after almost six years of abuse, because he was uh, he was arrested right either right before or just after my twelfth birthday, <clears throat> and um, so by that point he'd been you know getting away with this for a long time and he was very very comfortable and almost you know almost cocky about it and and so on the set of Clown House a bunch of the cast and crew had noticed our interactions and the way that like. He always had me sitting on his lap in the director's chair when I wasn't, you know, in a scene. And yep. just, it, it was very, very inappropriate. And and so these, you know, cast and crew members were like coming to my mom and just like, what, this is something that's not right. You know, like, that's not normal interaction for a director and a child actor to have. And um, so that's really what just made my mom just keep pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. And it was like literally... Within a couple of days after shooting, wrapping up the shoot, um, photography for it, that I told her, you know, I have a secret that I want to tell you, and I just told her. And again, I, I tried to protect her. I, I did. I only told her, like, you know, maybe very little. <laughs> what? Uh, what did your? What was your mom's first reaction? Um, that one, I, I, I don't know. I don't really know. I think that's been blocked out. Hmm. Honestly, it's, uh, I, I know that she, I remember her crying all the time. That's, you know, that's the main thing I remember is he, she just cried all the time. Can't imagine being put in that situation. You know, I don't have kids, but, um, I've now talked with enough uh, victims to, to realize that, um, I mean, you want to talk about a realistic hell. Um, that this not only puts the victims through, but also the, the families that support the victims, uh, the parents knowing that potentially, you know, their, their child, uh, whom they are uh, responsible for protecting and loving and, and nurturing, um, that something like this happened to their child, um, you know, obviously completely um, out of their realm of, of um, necessarily protecting uh, because they trust this, this mm -hmm. pedophile. Uh, now, tell me something. Take us through the steps of how Victor Salva was held accountable for molesting you as a child. Uh, let's see. It was a well, when, they, when he was arrested. It was a sting operation, mm -hmm. uh, first of all. And so after we finished up principal photography for Clown House, um, because of the cameras we used, were uh, literally the ones that George Lucas used for American Graffiti. Wow. And. So they were really old, outdated cameras, and they were extremely loud. So every bit of sound on that film had to be dubbed over. And so <laughs> it was basically a month of shooting and then a month of overdubs. And it was right in between, like right in the first couple of days of doing the overdubs that the, the police did the sting operation and caught him just a couple of miles away from his house. And then, I mean, the, they found, you know, like a pr pretty much a kitty porn den just videotapes upon videotapes and photo albums full of like boys modeling underwear for you know macy's or sears plus wow. pictures of countless little boys um and all sorts of just really really disgusting stuff was found and victor admitted to all of it he he admitted to all of it until um there was an attorney involved and coppola is where the attorney came in like that's that's where the money came from for the attorney for Victor's attorney was, so Coppola gets him this really you know expensive lawyer, and um, and then it turns into where he you know, because the police already had on file on record him admitting to all these things because he was arrested on eleven counts of, of child molestation, including uh, oral sodomy on a on a child under fourteen you know oral copulation on a child under fourteen videotaping these things like I mean. And then, you know, several charges that had to do with the production of Clown House and being abused during that production. Mm -hmm. 
So he, of course, retracts everything, and the lawyers get him to shut his mouth and, you know, stop making their jobs harder. And um, eventually what happened was at some point Coppola filed a lawsuit against my family for $5 million um, for some breach of contract or something. And uh, my lawyer called my parents one day um, and said, you know, the appointment we had with Victor's attorneys are not, it, it's been rescheduled. It's been pushed till, till, till tomorrow. Uh, so you guys don't need to come in today. And so, I, you know, we stayed home and my attorney actually went down and met with Victor's lawyers and signed up, you know, wrote up a plea bargain and had it signed. And um, the plea bargain dropped the six most severe charges, the ones that had to do with uh, the production of Clown House and the abuse. And he was convicted on five, the five least severe charges, or signed a plea bargain of that and um, was sentenced three years. And he, maybe he was in jail for a short time when he was first arrested, but after that, um, he didn't go to prison. He never saw another jail cell. He went to a treatment facility um, in Napa. Oh, and, uh, what a retreat. How months. lovely. Right. Right. Yeah, he did 15 months. So, I'm and sorry. He had movie deals waiting for him. You know, like he had, it was like, you know, warm reception when he got out of his treatment and was right back to work, you know, shortly thereafter. All right. So, Francis Ford Coppola... Uh, stepped in to not only help him, but then he sued you. Yes. It was, what a it was, slime bag. Are you kidding me? He, th th this notable, legendary Hollywood director stepped in to not only <laughs> throw sand in your face, uh, but to help someone that had been arrested on unspeakable charges. Mm-hmm. On in fact, freaking um, once, the, once the film was, because I still had to go and do all the overdubs <laughs> So after he was arrested. So I still had a month's worth of work at Coppola's house every single day for, you know, eight or nine hours every day for a month. Um, where it's which time I was like blackballed, told I'd never work in the industry again. And, sure. You know, like all sorts of stuff. And, and um, you know, <sighs> yeah, it was... Incredible. <laughs> so but tell they, me, they, how long uh, did Victor uh, self? I mean, he, he only, you said 15 months. He only served really a 15 month sentence. Um, after molesting you, what, what was your life like in that period where now he went to jail, not prison, but now he, he went away for a little bit? Um, what is the aftermath for somebody that has been victimized um, in, in relation to all that? Well, at that point, I had lost my best friend. Yeah. You know, my acting career was gone. And um, the abuse at school was, like, unbearable. Um, because our local newspaper, the Contra Costa Times, actually printed my name in an article about, I don't know, about that long, little side column article, and printed my name seven times, my full name, mm. as well as both my parents' names. And um, so... After that story broke, I went to school that Monday, and it was just an instant thing. Like, all the kids hushed talking and pointing and calling me all sorts. Of, I mean, I've been called any name you can possibly imagine. I've been, I've, it's been, you know, said to me at one point or another. Um, so, and this is all right as I'm coming into puberty, right? Like, seventh grade. And so it was... Um, Luckily, I, you know, my family loves me and, and I had a good therapist because that was part of the, the settlement was that I would go to therapy from 12 to 18. So, you know, my therapist was good. And but I mean, there is a lot of suicide. I mean, I'll be honest with you. The first time I tried to commit suicide, I was seven. Wow. And and suicide was a very prominent uh, thought in my mind during those years. And I had been doing drugs, and I was, like, it's very promiscuous. It's, like, anything you can imagine that you wouldn't want your child to be doing, you know, that's pretty much what I was going through at that time. I went to five different schools in two years. Wow. I mean, just of, to... Of abuse. 
Just to try and escape it. Right. To try to get to a school where maybe they didn't know who I was, but there was always somebody. And once one person knows, that's it. I mean, and this is pre-internet. Yes. Wow. Yeah, we're talking like nine or uh, you know, eighty-eight. Sure. Eighty-nine. So. Mm-hmm. Victor Salvo went on to direct uh, other films and continue to work in the industry after being convicted of molesting you, uh, even being ha- having to register as a sex offender for life, even. Uh, how does that make you feel, knowing that uh, he continues to work to this very day? Um, in my opinion, I think it shows, it's a definite, um, it just shows how really kind of messed up our culture is mm. and what we accept as a culture, as a society, as a whole, what we find acceptable. Um, it's, it's pretty sad to me. That that's how the way things are, but you know, when it comes down to it, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I've I've never tried to stop the man from working. At all, ever. I I don't go after all of his movies. I've never protested like Rosewood Lane or Nature of the Beast or any of his films unless it was directly related to children or there was children involved in the filming. That's the only time I've ever protested any of his films or stood up and said like, oh wait, let me blow the whistle here because. This is who this guy is, you know? I mean, everybody needs to remember what this guy has done, you know? And so, really, it wasn't until about 20 that that's when Powder came out. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was, like, at work one day, and I got a call from my auntie, and she said, "Uh, Nathan, I just wanted to tell you I'm really sorry, but I was just watching TV, and I saw a, a trailer for a film that I really thought looked good, and so I, you know do what I always do and check at the end to see the credits, who wrote and directed it. And, and Victor wrote it and directed it. And it's got Mary Steenburgen and, you know, Jeff Goldblum and da, 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 da. And so I'm at like, I'm 20 years old and I'm at work and I'm just like, just got hit in the gut, you know, I'm just like, whoa, you know? And then she um, tells me that it was produced by Disney. And so I, I just got off the phone and I, I remember just sitting there kind of like trying to hold back the tears at work and, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking it took about a half an hour and I just made the decision. I'm like, well, I can't allow this. So I'm going to just, you know, maybe I'll call the local Fox news station or I'll call, you know, just, I'll try to get a hold of some sort of press, you know, and, and see if anybody wants to do a story on this. Um, and literally as I'm like accepting this and, and making that decision, I get a call from somebody from the associated press and it just was a powder keg. It just blew up. I mean, and from that moment on, it was like a whirlwind of, of interviews and, you know, just all over the country doing, you know, shows and uh, really just laying it all out there for the world to see and to know what Victor really is. And, um, you know, I, I was the opposition was, I would say at that time, it was about 60 40. Um, 60% of the people were like supportive of me, but you know, there's the 40% that would call me all sorts of names and tell me I was doing it for all the wrong reasons and try to discredit me. And, um, and then you got people like Eisner down at Disney going on record and saying that, uh, it was a one, one time inappropriate touching incident between a grown man and a consenting minor. Oh, right. Right. I mean, think about those words, Wade, right. That's very the suggestion in that is very uh completely opposite of what it really is you know first of all they lied about it being a one-time inappropriate touching incident and second of all when you hear the words consenting minor you think statutory rape at best right like 17 he's 16 at the at you know worst 16 year old kid and and then at that time coppola also went on record and and uh connor fraser the director of the documentary um, actually found this this article. I don't know how he dug it up, but it's Coppola being interviewed, and he goes on to say how, um, you know, I was basically talked to, talked about me as if I was like this little harlot slut boy, right? Mm-hmm. And that I, you know, wore the wrong outfit or kind of, I mean, like literally it was on along those lines, not those words, but along those lines. But what he did say uh, pretty much verbatim was that, uh, 
Victor was practically a kid himself. The age difference was none too much. Oh. Um, and, um, you know, and then the reporter that, that wrote the story went on to say, well, actually, you know, the difference was Victor was 29, Nathan was 12, or actually 11 when Victor was re- arrested. And, um, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of like what anyone that's been in his, his court or, you know, on his team over there is tried, tried to discredit and try to mislead people constantly throughout the entire thing. It's been constant right up to last year when we started doing the documentary and I, I did a interview on Ed Opperman on the Opperman reports Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, pretty much him and all of his, his producers, everybody, you know, like that he knew was all under the impression that this was a one-time incident, that they had no idea that it was like, you know, almost six years worth of abuse. So that's pretty much what I've been up against the, the whole time is is their influence and their being able to mislead people and trying to discredit me. And, I'll, you know, I'll say for the record again that I never accepted one deal, not one cent throughout, literally. Not one deal or one cent did I accept. Um, and I've had offers like you wouldn't believe to sell out. Well, the fact that uh, it feels like you continue to be victimized uh, by his inner circle even uh, for years leading after the conviction of Victor Salva, and, and here you are today, obviously a man now, and a, an adult man mm-hmm. now. Uh, you mentioned there, we're talking about a documentary at this point, um, you just mentioned the, the director's name. Uh, what can you tell us about this mm-hmm. documentary that now you have produced, you have created? Um, what's it about, and what's your mission behind it? Um, really, so how the documentary came to be is, again, I've had tons of offers from countless people to do things and and it just not enough of their answers were right for me to want to work on it because that's one thing Wade I will not do is I will not sell out a victim a child a survivor I won't do that not for all the money not for all the stars I wouldn't do that um, so when Connor got a hold of me on Facebook last year it was the end of May and he just he had the right things you know like he had the right the same things to say and even if some of his answers weren't exactly what I was looking for, most of them were close enough to where it was like, okay, yeah, let's 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 do this. Let's make this film. You know, one of the main things he had said was, you know, um, Victor's had his chance. Victor's done all. You know, he's been coddled and totally, uh, you know, catered to throughout, and nobody knows who you are. You know, you have this huge support following, like on these horror fan sites that sure. you know, I had no idea and. So he was like, you know, you got all this support and all these people are out there just and they want to know your story. You know, 30 years after the fact, people are still wanting to know your side of the story and I want to help you tell it. And so that's what we did. We um, we started a GoFundMe. We raised a little over three thousand dollars and that's what we made the film on. You know, it's been Connor and I throughout the entire thing have been like, you know, it's always been a 50 50 thing with me and Connor. Um, It's kind of his vision, but it's my story. And so we made it all with, you know, under 3,500 bucks. And his idea was to, I flew out to Roanoke, Virginia, where we sat, proceeded to sit in a hotel room for two weeks straight, literally went out to dinner, I think twice. The rest of the time we were eating like from the, you know, Sonic across the street. And um, he wanted me somewhere where I was completely unfamiliar and vulnerable and uh, we just sat there and we shot everything within those two weeks. And one of my biggest stipulations was that I had control over the music, the score. So I scored the film myself. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's it's really a very, very personal project. Like it's, it, it, all of it is straight from the heart and from the soul. And, you know, Connor adds an entire different element to it because he's not a victim. He's never been abused. And so, and he's, I will, I'll tell you this too. He's, he's now, he was 20 during the time that we shot it, but he's now 21, but he's a young kid. This is his first project. And I've got to commend him. I got to commend him. I really do because this is an awfully big bite for your first one. You know, this is a, this is a big bite to take. It's very risky um, in the sense that it could, go one way or the other if it has like no you know if hollywood and and the powers that be decide to throw money at 
someone to, you know, like try to tear it down and make it so it never sees the light of day. You know, Connor could, his career could be in the dumps because of that. But I've had faith all along. I, you know, just the fact that people after 30 years still want to know my side of the story, want to know what happened with me, was enough for me to know that, you know, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that. So Connor's it's had a, a lot of faith and it's been, been, quite, it's been, been quite a process. process. I, I can't even sense. imagine what it must be like to uh, live with this for over 30 years and then to have to rehash it uh, over and over again in front of different audiences. Yeah. But I know it's important to you to get the message out and to sort of expose the fact that right. this sort of thing still happens. I cannot thank you enough for having the courage to speak out on this and to even have created a documentary film that touches uh, on your life and these experiences and, and helping people to understand it a little bit better. There is such a need for that right now as we continue to go down these dark sort of rabbit holes within this entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. Um, it is horrifying to know that not only has this happened, it continues to happen and we have an industry mm -hmm. that accepts it and is fine with it happening mm -hmm. because they continue to dole out assignment and work and um, allowing known convicted uh, sex offenders to work not only with children but uh, within the studio ranks as well. Nathan, mm -hmm. um, is is there anything else that we should know about the film? Uh, when can people sort of expect to see it? Uh, where where can people find out more about it? Uh, anything else? Um, yeah, so there's a website. Um, it's NathanForceWinters.com, and the trailer for the documentary is up there now. It's also on YouTube, available on YouTube. Um, I believe it's the babysitter documentary or mm -hmm. official babysitter documentary teaser trailer that's up right now. We have been accepted into, I think, three film festivals right now. Um, and so that leads to the GoFundMe. The taking action, breaking silence is really, again, it's taking action is what we all need to do as either survivors, as non-survivors that are adults. We need to take yeah. action. We need to, you know, reclaim our duty as adults and protect our children. That's the taking action. And breaking the silence is, is when you're abused, it's this dirty little secret, this dark little secret that, you know, they take, they, that they place on you, this guilt and this shame that is, is placed on you. And so you end up keeping this dirty little secret. And um, breaking the silence is, is one of the most empowering things a victim can do is to stand up and say, look, this is what happened to me. This is who did it. And when they when you do that, it's like the first step into healing and the first step to becoming a survivor is to break that silence and to no longer keep their secret. Because the truth is that it's not theirs. It's not ours. You know, um, people say all the time that they that I had my innocence stolen. And, and then for a time I did. But in truth, I took it back. And, and that's part of being a survivor is is realizing that innocence is yours and yours alone and the, and no one can take it unless you give it up and that's that's just that's just how it is it's unless you give up your innocence willingly nobody can take it so you know i may have had my childhood stolen yes was i allowed to be a child no but my innocence is mine i preserve that that's mine alone and so that's really what the taking action breaking silence is um the campaign the the fundraising campaign is is for Connor and myself so we can enter the film into various film festivals because a lot of them have entry fees. And in order to attend them and do like we, we were try, you know, we're working on setting up Q and A's after some of them. Um, you know, obviously we would need traveling expenses and, and, you know, so it's, again, it's one of those things that it, it takes money in order to, to actually get a film out there and to get it, you know, any kind of promotion and, and, so it takes money, and him and I are both like, you know, we're pre-tapped. You know, we've done yeah. everything um, since the GoFundMe last year in um, August and, and September, and when we used it to do the film in October, we've had, you know, we both work or whatever, and, and you know, nine to five. But it's like we just we can't afford any of these entry fees. We can't afford to go. You know, like we've been accepted into one, I think, in Buffalo, and we're going to do a Q and A live after that. And we can't, we can't afford to go to Buffalo. We can't, you know. Um, so that's really where the the GoFundMe comes into is is you know, in order to get this film the exposure it, it deserves, and for it to actually to meet its potential, we're going to 
we need some funds, you know, sure. and, and you've so managed that's why we're to asking for that. Do all of this on a shoestring budget? Uh, can't even believe you've managed to pull off what you have already um, with as little money as it's cost you to uh, produce things and create things. Uh, so I can't tell uh, my listeners, our viewers, how important this is. Thank you for being a part of the program today and for sharing uh, your harrowing story and for not giving up. Uh, hope that there will be a better tomorrow and that we can expose um, exactly what's going on in this very unfortunate industry. Uh, you take care, sir, and we will be in touch again. Thank you, Wade.